The Bible said there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? <clears throat> can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that notorious scripture, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. With Christmas on the horizon, just a couple of few weeks away, it seems like that as bad as this year has been, it uh, has not slowed down for anything. But Christmas is still one of the most celebrated, if not the most celebrated holiday throughout the year. We travel back to Bethlehem in our minds and we experience the scene of the Christ child in the manger. And we try to imagine what that holy night must have been like for those that experienced it. And there's something comforting about the baby Jesus in line in the manger. But we cannot really grasp the full uh, of thing of the scene of the manger without understanding the scene of of the cross. Amen. After all it is Calvary that is the fulfillment of the manger. He was laid in a manger. But according to Jesus in John chapter 3 as he speaks to Nicodemus he's going to be raised up on a cross. Amen. Nicodemus a Pharisee that came to see Jesus came to see him and speak to him at night. And Jesus tells Nicodemus as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted it up. John's revelation and John's record of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now Matthew, Mark, and Luke are so much alike in their reporting of the life and works of Jesus and John is so much different that the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke is considered the synoptic Gospels, S-Y-N, synagogue, synoptic, which means alike or similar. You can read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. You find all the similar stories. You find all the similar types of writing. But John takes off on a completely different thing. And the crucifixion in the first three Gospels reveal a tragic time that the crucifixion is, is seen as a tragedy. But John reveals the crucifixion in a different light. Jesus said, I'm going to be living. It up. And even though it told the death that he was going to die, John says this is when the Son of the living God is exalted. When he is lifted up, that is when God glorified the Son of God when he was lifted up on a cross. He was laid in a manger only to be lifted up on a cross. I read where somebody said we want a God without wrath who takes a man without sin into a kingdom without justice. Through administration of a Christ 
without a cross. You see, the world loves to hear about baby Jesus in a manger. But when you bring forth the Son of God hanging up on a cross, it's a different gospel. Amen? Hallelujah to God. Regardless of how hard that we try, we cannot escape the words of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And how did He get Him? He gave Him on an old rugged cross 2,000 years ago. He was born and laid in a manger only to be raised up on a cross. Jesus spoke to Nicodemus there. He speaks these words. Nicodemus said, Good master, you have to be a teacher come from God because you can't do the things that you have done except God be with him. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, the son of man, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the serpent represented the bite, the sting of sin that had bitten humanity. Serpents had been turned loose upon the children of Israel because of their disobedience. And Moses raised up a brazen serpent upon a rod and stuck it up where they could see. And the Lord said, those that look upon it shall be healed. God is on trial today. God is separated from the person Jesus Christ in our world today. And this was of significant importance to Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. They say that there were about 6,000 Pharisees in Jesus' day. They held to the rabbinic tradition. They were the party of the synagogue that practiced strict legalism. They believed in the supernatural. They believed in demons. They believed in angels. They believed in the resurrection. And they expected the apocalyptic coming of the kingdom of God. But while they had some good qualities, they basically saw God as the lawgiver yes. and not of love. But Jesus said, God so loved the world. He brought something new to their mind. He brought something new to their understanding. What is God like? Religions have always struggled with the issue of what God is like. To the Egyptian, God is immorality. To the Hebrew, God is the righteous law. To the Hindu, He is truth and bliss. To the Buddhist, He is the force of the universe. To the ancient Greek, he's wisdom. To the Muslim, he's authority. To the humanist, God is the power of human potential. To the scientist, God is natural law. But to the Christian, God is love. But he's not just any love. His love is not an abstract idea of love. Like that we love things or we love people. But God's love, his love is a concrete action. It is what God done. It is what God does. It is who he is. That he loves us today. The writer of 1 John 4 said, And this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, Woo! and that he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. One of the greatest statements in all the Bible comes from the book that Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 5 and verse 8. He said, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were set, set sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. God loves. It is a concrete action of God. When, when Jesus told Nicodemus that God loved it brings a new understanding. It takes uh, uh, Nicodemus down a different mentality avenue. But then if the first statement wasn't strange enough and hard enough for Nicodemus to grasp, the following statement definitely caught him off guard. When Jesus said, God so loved the world. Nicodemus expected him to say he loves the Pharisees. He loves the Jews. He loves his own people. He loves the covenanted people. He loves the righteous people. He loves the nation of Israel. But the world, the world would include the pagans and the idolaters, even Rome, the enemy of Israel. Does God love the enemy of Israel? See, Israel had been subjected to Gentile powers one after another, always fighting for their freedom, fighting, fighting to preserve the religious and cultural distinctives. Did God love it? Did God love the enemies of Israel? Did he love Rome? Did God love the King Herod? Did, did, did God, does God love Caesar? 
This was going through this man's mind. He is, a, he is an older middle-aged man and he is a Pharisee. He knows the law. Ever jot and tittle and Jesus is speaking things to him that is foreign to his understanding. Jesus was also including Nicodemus in the world. The Pharisees, you see, saw themselves as spiritually superior to everybody else. But Jesus puts the good and the bad together in the category of need and redemption. The same thing when John the Baptist called the Jews out to his baptism and told them they needed to be baptized and they need to be baptized to repentance. You see, we all have a common problem no matter who we are, what color our hair is, how old that we are, what family we come from, what nation, nationality we are from. We all have a common problem. You may not be like me in certain ways. You may like certain things. I don't like certain things. We may be different in a lot of ways. But we are all common in one way, and that is we were born in sin, and we needed a Redeemer, and we needed a Savior today. God loves each of us as though... We were the only ones for him to love, Augustine said. You see, we all stand equal at the foot of the old rugged cross. That's why nobody should judge another. At some time, another, each one of us had a need of grace. But Jesus said, God so loved the world. How do we measure God's love? How do we know how much God really loves? It's that he gave his only begotten son. Love came in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Love was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the expression of the love of God. Without Jesus, love becomes nothing but sentimental. But God puts it in flesh that we can see it and that we can touch it and that we can know it in John. Love is mentioned in 1 John over 43 times and the word this in response 29 times of defining the love of God in Jesus Christ. God wanted us to know that he was loved. That's why that he sent his son. Jesus is the expression of of the love of God. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. Jesus is the very essence of God. Now the church wrestled with this in the fourth century. There was a lot of uh, heresies that were going on and a man named Arius uh, did not come up with this idea of his, of his own but he was a, of a, a student of others before him but Arius said that if Jesus was begotten, then there was a time that he did not exist. And that if there was a time that Jesus did not exist, there was a time that he was born. If there was a time that he was born, then he is a good man, he is a creature, but he's not God. And you know, there's many in our world today that say that Jesus is a prophet. He may be the son of God, but he's not equal with God. He is not God. And there's even theologians that say nowhere in the scripture does it say that Jesus claimed to be God. And I wonder what scripture they read. John is notorious for his theology about the oneness of God in Jesus Christ. It is here, it is in, G, in God giving His only begotten Son that we see the divinity of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God that is coexistent, eternal, and equal with the Father. Jesus said in John 10 and 30, I and my Father are one. John is different in the beginning of his gospel where the other scriptures begin with the birth of Jesus Christ. I believe maybe Mark begins with the baptism of John the Baptist, but John begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning. With God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is the same substance. He is the same essence. He is the same material, the same stuff that God is. Hallelujah to God today. God loved the world and he expressed it through his son Jesus Christ. Amen. Back a couple years ago you remember that I got hung up on this council in Nicaea in the, in the fourth century. And the argument was whether Jesus was God or not. Was, was he the same as God or was he something different? And I was infatuated with the word that they came up with in the council of Nicaea, and they declared that Jesus was homoousios with the Father. That means he is of the same essence. He is of the same substance. 
And R.C. Sproul says, if those words are too high for you, stuff. He is the same stuff. He was God in the flesh. Amen. You see, Jesus was God's gift to us. The word grace means to give freely. And how did God give that gift? He gave it not wrapped in a manger, but He gave it wrapped on the cross. Amen? Amen. E.S. John writes of a Hindu that commented on the difference between him, the religion of Hinduism and Christianity. He said the difference between Hinduism and Christianity is this. We have to climb the ladder of austerity to get to Brahma. He don't lift a finger to help us. But in Christianity, God comes to the bottom rung yes. at no cost. The cost of the cross to help us make it to the topmost rung. The difference is, is decisive. All we need to do to be saved from our sins and have eternal life is to receive the gift that God gave us. What about that today? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He gave His Son. He gave His only begotten Son. Begotten, not the same word as I begot Tyler and I begot Lexi and you beget your children. It is a spiritual uh, word, begotten. He is different. He was the only begotten of the Father. And then Jesus said that whosoever believeth in him. This may be the most important word in one of the most important verses in the Bible. Whosoever. Whosoever. I read about a preacher that was, uh, a co as a college student, he ended up close to a, a, a gay parade, a gay rights rally in the 70s. He was going to a convention at the World Congress Center and it just happened to be there at the same time as the rally was going on. They were protesting the Christian gathering being held at the World Congress Center. And he noticed a sign that was being held by a young person in the crowd. And that sign said, Jesus died for somebody's sin, but it wasn't for mine. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. They missed the good news of Jesus Christ somehow in their life. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus died for that person's sins. Uh, he died for Herod's sins. He died for Caesar's sins. He died for your sins. And he died for my sins today. Whosoever believes in him. That word belief involves a personal faith on a personal revelation. That's why you can't just come to a church, start going to a church, get baptized, and that you take it in. You can get baptized the rest of your life and, and join every church in the country and go straight to hell with all kinds of, of church membership. But you see, belief, faith in God involves personal revelation. Jesus said in John, matter of fact, no man cometh to the Father except the Spirit that sent me draws him. That's why you can't get right with God just any time that you please. It is a spiritual work. It is not simply, you know, many times we're guilty. We'll say all, all you got to do is believe. You got to have faith. It is by your faith that you are saved. But you see, when we say that I had strong enough so that you get saved and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe that you're a Christian, you're going to heaven, but your friend sitting beside of you didn't believe in Christ, is it because that you were a better person because you believed and they were a bad person because they didn't? John just told us it's not because that we love God. It's because God loves us. It's an amazing gift this morning. It's got nothing to do with you. It is the gift of God that passes all understanding today. Like the centurion at the cross, Jesus died for your sins, not just the world's sins. He said, whosoever believes in him. Belief requires action. Belief requires obedience. A whole lot of things that I can't tell you about theologically, a lot of things in the Bible that I don't know, but I can tell you this. I tell you that what won't happen if you believe in Christ. You'll not perish. Right. And I believe I can tell you what you will do and what you will have if you do believe in Jesus Christ, you'll have eternal life. Amen. There's a lot of things I can't tell you, but I can tell you that whosoever Amen. believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us all over the house this morning?